I was asked to talk on the rapidly changing policy environment for open access. It is very rapidly changing, and a lot has happened in the last year. Are you, are you doing my slides? Okay. It was described by the uh, Director General of WIPO as a perfect storm, like nothing we've ever seen in the world. So this, this movement of digital media and new publishing models and changing IP models is no small thing. This, incidentally, is from last week's um, Hurricane Sandy. And clearly, that's what it feels to lots of like to lots of people in the university sector and in the publishers who are trying to grapple with them. At that same conference, the director of the STM Publishers Association described it as a tsunami. And that doesn't exactly suggest to me that the publishers are complacent about this, in spite of what, what a lot of academics say. Uh, what has happened, next slide, is that open access has moved right into the mainstream. For me, it means I'm no longer coming to these conferences as an activist, um, somebody from the fringe who you might regard as loony. I'm now in the mainstream. The big guys in this game are behind me. So I can talk with confidence, and I think you have to listen, because it's happening, and it's going to change all our lives. Next slide. There's been a surge in regional and global policies from the big international organizations, regional policies, government policies, and I don't talk that much about university policies except to say what needs to be done, because there's so many of those that we in Africa should be ashamed that we're so far behind the field, as many of us are. Next slide. The basis for this, it has to be noticed, is a, is a human rights approach drawing on the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in issues like access to science and access to scientific knowledge and access to cultural knowledge. So that is a very, very strong push. And um, it has behind it moral mandates that need to be listened to. Next slide. But along with that comes a rhetoric that supports the idea that open access is a way to innovation and thus to economic growth and attention to social development issues. This is very important because this is where African universities and African countries seem to get into the most divided position. Innovation all too often in our governments is seen as innovation systems. In other words, you've got to protect everything, you've got to lock it down with IP, you've got to patent it, and then you've got to exploit it commercially. And not enough attention is paid to the need for research to have impact on social and development issues, and not enough attention is paid to the considerable power that access to information produced by researchers has in driving the growth of particularly small businesses, but large businesses as well, and in providing solutions to issues, say in public health, where access to information is enormously important. Studies have shown, for example, in Denmark, that medium to, to small tech companies suffer bitterly, and it costs them a lot of money, even if they don't have access to failed research because the same mistakes get made again and again. So we have to look at this divided system and recognize that information is very important in our societies, um, in a knowledge society, in a networked society. Next slide. So what we've got to remember before we look at all the other policies is at the heart of the debate about policy for open access is a debate about intellectual property. And one of the major movements in intellectual property at the moment is IP for Public Justice, which was launched last year with the Washington Declaration for in on Intellectual Property in the Public Interest. And this is a team of IP lawyers, the, some of the most prominent IP lawyers in the world. There were 38 countries at the Congress. And they mobilize immediately when there is another of those industry pushbacks that tries to in increase um, enforcement, tries to set up massive costs for infringement, tries to drive the internet back into a locked closet. 
And it has been hugely um, uh, effective just in a year, largely responsible for the rejection of the counterfeit treaty in Europe. So quite a powerful movement. Sign it as well as the Berlin Declaration this week. But watch that divide. There's a fight going on between the enforcement of copyright by what call themselves big industries but actually aren't that big, which would close down a lot of the public benefits that we feel we need. Next slide. So let's start with all these policies. The wave started last year with UNESCO and its um, program for open access to scientific information. Next slide. What, that, what UNESCO is doing is driving open access with the aim of changing policy in national governments and institutions particularly in national governments. This has been approved by the member states of UNESCO. So in other words, our government has approved this policy. And the idea is that national governments should have open access policies. Ours doesn't in a concerted way in South Africa, nor do many of our African colleagues in the SADC region. Our government has open access policies in fragmented areas, like the, the Academy of Science program for open access journals, but at the same time it passes intellectual property acts like the IP Act for uh, publicly funded research, which I ironically calls for public, fun, publicly funded research to be locked down and patented, and you have to ask permission of the government unless you patent it. And if that's the case and your university is struggling, UCT has a very good IP policy to deal with this. We could talk about that. But the truth is that United, UNESCO is going to be moving into African countries in particular because that's their strategic focus. They're going to be having workshops. They're going to be talking to governments. And if their open education resource uh, movement is anything to go by, in a few years we're going to find our government starting to enact open access policies at top level. So that will be a top-down push, although it's also happening from the bottom up. Next slide. Policy change. The focus is Africa and also gender, and we need to think about how gender fits into this particular program. Thank you. And the UNESCO has formulated, and this is actually a very useful matrix, um, a visualization of the problems that are faced and the issues that have to be resolved. And the challenges you can see in that challenge box are policy development, <coughs> capacity development, the cost of journal sub subscriptions, um, toll access publishing, publishing fees. You'll find a lot in here that's familiar. But fundamentally, they're asking for all of this to be looked at in a concerted way so that we can resolve the issues that we face. But in looking at this and in thinking about it from an African perspective, and I am part of and um, lead the Scholarly Communication in Africa program, we're finding the problems aren't always quite as contained and neat as they look. Next slide. If you look at African universities, they face massive capacity issues that are systemic across the university. South Africa escaped a lot of this. We are recovering from apartheid, but we are not recovering from structural adjustment. Think about the history of African universities. Only really started happening for the most part after independence, so you are talking about roughly the 1960s. Got going for a couple of decades, and then the World Bank and the IMF decided that actually universities weren't important for um, development and uh, development issues, and the countries had to focus on funding primary education. And if you have sarcasm in my voice, it's deliberate, and I'm very glad that the World Bank has changed its mind. But then for the 1980s and 1990s, the African universities were ground into the dust. Um, their funding was cut back, governments had to divert funding to primary education, professors were moonlighting as taxi drivers. It was really very, very damaging to the system. In about 2000, suddenly the World Bank and the IMF decided, no, 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 universities are very important. And so now the African universities had to restart with a teaching and learning mission. Increase your student numbers, focus on teaching and learning, get going. Just got running with that when the next news came in. You've got to do research. 
you've got to be research universities. And um, being focused on results, started talking about ISI impact, journal articles and research production and so on. But that was layered on top of the teaching and learning. So the resource issues in African universities are huge. And the capacity to implement something in the university is constrained by multiple strands of gaps and dysfunctions. Think about your university if you come from the north. And think about what it would be like if you'd been only going for 15 years, like the University of Namibia. How much infrastructural capacity would you have? So anything that has to get moving by way of digital media and digital communications in African universities has to be fully integrated so that you're looking at ICT provision, teaching and learning, research, the library, and, and the research administration and the top administration and finance, everything has to be meshed and mapped so that you can take what is needed in this environment, which is an integrated approach. And it's not easy. Many African universities are doing very well at it, but it's not an easy task. Next slide. The other thing that needs to be paid attention to is that if you introduce technology to support publishing or open access publishing, all too often we think of platforms. You know, have a repository platform or have a journal systems platform and then people will be able to do this. And again, this has to be integrated systemically into the university so that technology is across the board an issue that is leveraged into all the environments in which communication happens. Research, research communications, teaching and learning, um, social media. So a lot of capacity building has to go on around um, the technology platforms. One of the issues there is library training. Library training is not focused on digital media to the extent it is in many northern countries. And so you get gaps in the library's ability to deal with digital communications, and that becomes a priority issue. Thank you. And then there's the impact factor, says I with a deep sigh. And I chose this picture very carefully. The impact factor is a massive car smash. The impact factor is accepted as gospel by a lot of academics and universities and governments. But you need to know a few things about it before you sign into this particular Holy Bible. First of all, it's the outcome of a process of commercialization of journals that was started by Robert Maxwell. Now, Robert Maxwell, no longer alive, is to be compared with Rupert Mur Murdoch. Same scenario, same idea about how the world works. Robert Maxwell would have liked the impact factor to be owned by Elsevier, which was his company at that stage, and he would have liked to have the impact built in there so that journals and impact factor could have a complete monopoly position. The other thing you need to know about the impact factor is that it's no accident that us African researchers can't get into journals that are high in the impact factor. It's not an accident. It was decided by Thomson Reuters the one company that owns the impact, the, 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 the um, ISI indexes, was decided by Thomson Reuters in 1982 in a meeting that mainstream research, effectively, if you look at their definition, means the global north, but particularly the US, Britain, and maybe Europe. At that stage, the US and, and Britain. Third world science, as they called it, would be included in the impact factor if it addressed issues that were strong in the mainstream. So do you hear it? We're out there. We're out there. And what matters to us doesn't necessarily matter in the impact factor. You have to publish what is important to the US and to Britain. So for example, the editor of The Lancet said, I cannot publish much African research at all. Because if I want my journal to be high in the impact factor, and if, if I want my journal to get those impact scores, I have to publish what gets lots of citations. And that is clinical trials that are of interest to Britain and America. So we are excluded. And I wasn't joking either when I said to the open access publishers a few weeks ago in Budapest that the impact factor kills people. Because it does. Um, until. Biomed came along with its um, 
malaria journal and PLOS started publishing effectively in neglected and tropical diseases, it was very difficult to get that kind of research published. 650,000 people a year might die of malaria, but there was more published in the big journals on acne than on malaria. And um, I think the, there was one wonderful statement that actually there's more published on Alzheimer's in pet dogs that on sleep, than on sleeping sickness. Now, I mean, I, I, I am provocative in this, but it's something we have to deal with. For the rest of the world, um, those who can publish in those journals, they're beginning to recognize how dysfunctional they are. The impact factor measures a journal. Okay, so that journal published X number of articles in two years. How many times was that journal cited? And they do a comp computation that then is equally divided among the authors. So Stephen Curry said, any university that judges its academics by their scores in the ISI impact factor is statistically illiterate. Any researcher who computes his or her status as a researcher according to the impact factor is statistically illiterate. Now that's coming out of the UK, Bjorn, Bjorn Brems from, from Germany is making the same arguments. So there's strong arguments now emerging, although we've gone on with this a long time. It's a very useful index for bureaucrats who can tick off boxes. But I think it's past its sell-by date. And I think we need to look much more at altmetrics and how we can get our research profiled. So that is something that also has to be dealt with in this United Nations context. Next slide. This just very quickly, I'll leave it there because you can see it um, when the um, slide shows online. This shows how few African journals get into the ISI index journals. So how little we actually have to put online, apart from South Africa. And um, here are bibliometric, or bibliometric profiles again. Next slide, next slide. And then the next one. African universities, here. Yeah. We have support from our government. This is Blade and Zimande, our Minister of Higher Education. African universities are essentially consumers of knowledge, he says, in a neocolonial system. And we're defined as, in a knowledge society, um, what is being defined means two different things to the developed world and the African continent. The former are the producers and the latter are the consumers. And Zimande goes on to argue that African research is valuable and important and needs to be in the system and communicated to the rest of the world because they need it. All right, next slide. So UNESCO put on the table this idea that we promote research for open access. They've got a whole lot of policies in line about mandates and how you get research <coughs> online. But the next bit of the perfect storm that hit was the Finch report in the UK. And this proved very controversial. Next slide. What the Finch report recommends, and actually then came to be enforced by government, as you'll see in a moment, Finch report's recommendation is that any publicly funded research must be published in an open access journal. And if it cannot be published in an open access journal, then put it in a green root repository. But there will be a lot of pressure on academics funded, say, by anybody from the uh, Research Councils UK, or the Wellcome Trust, or DFID, or the EU, you're going to be under pressure to publish in open access journals. And it's predictable that it's created controversy. There has been a lot of debate about it. Next slide. This then was picked up by the UK government immediately and endorsed for implementation. But you must also understand that what is behind this is a commitment to spending money. If the government is going to say you need to publish in open access journals, the government is creating a fund which will be administered possibly through the research councils or direct to universities. But they've initially voted 10 million pounds to it and they are aiming to, to um, put about 30 million pounds a year to the whole system if they need. So you need to go open access, you need to publish open access if you're being publicly funded, and the government pays. That is a lesson to our governments. 
but a difficult one because they don't have a lot of money. But it does mean that our governments are going to have, a, have to reprioritize um, the idea of publication and communication if they are to be in the mainstream. Next slide. So Research Council UK has picked up on that. Next slide. The European Commission then followed suit. In Horizon 2020, the European Commission, I think, is spending 80 billion euros on issues around internet and technology infrastructure and communication of research, among other things. And it also says articles we made accessible in an open access <coughs> journal or in a repository. Next slide. The central message, next one, is investment in research communication and its infrastructure is essential. Across Southern Africa, our governments simply don't have national policies on research communications. They're going to have to have them very, very quickly. Otherwise, we're going to lose out. So I think we need to exert some upward pressure so that there is an acknowledgement that this is central now in the higher education field. And for South Africa, with a green paper on the table for higher and further education, and with proposals in it for open education resources, I think we need now to alert the South African government that it needs also to look at open access publishing and the whole question of research communications, which, as I said before, includes all the infrastructure and technology that researchers need for the research process and the products that come out of it. Next slide. So, of course, protest. Big debates in, 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 in the North in particular about green and gold route, and there have been howls of outrage, and the claim that the publishers are going to profiteer from this. I've been skeptical about that, because the publishers I saw at the Publishers Association Congress in Cape Town two months ago were not confident at all from what I could see. Trade publishers, maybe. But I think one of the things that might happen is a downward push on publishing costs. There might also be a push to reduce the number of journal articles published. In other words, to reverse the massive escalation in journal articles that was produced out of the ISI index and its prestige. We've gone really ramped up enormously what we, what we put out that way. So we'll have to watch that one and see if prices do go up, if there is price gouging. But I think, I've always thought that if one of you um, researchers sit down and you've written an article and you submit it and you have to submit to an open access journal now and the journal says I'm going to charge you you're going to say what? Where a librarian is at the mercy of a system where the librarian doesn't have control on subscription charges so I think there might be leverages. Next slide. There are the two routes, the green route those who support the idea that the best thing to do is to put articles in repositories have been outraged by this emphasis on open access journals because they feel that open access repositories are much better and easier and quicker to get into. And that's true, and open access repositories are hugely valuable and contain a lot of immensely valuable research in them. Next slide. And the other, of course, is the gold route, and um, that is pirated gold from West Africa. Um, that's the next slide. In both of these, the, article, the discussion is still largely about journals, and we need to acknowledge that now, because one of my arguments is we look too much at journal articles. That's not all we produce. Somehow, even though open access includes all kinds of outputs, we've got fixated in this tunnel vision. We are mad about journals. I'm a publisher by background, and I would go along with my open source techie son who said, what are we doing with 17th century technology? You know, why are we still there? We're seeing it being broken open in the open access journals. But we need to question what it is we produce, particularly in networked science and the use of semantic technologies. What is it that we need to get out there? And what needs to be made open in order for us to have an effective system? <coughs> Next slide. And when you look essentially at the debate, though, between green and gold, um, what the open access journals offer is your ability to have the article of record open. 
You go into your repository, you have either preprint, you have a draft of your article. It's not the final article. It's not the, the finally accredited one with all the illustrations in it and all the editing changes. And that, the Finch Commission argued, was important. And Martin Hall was one of the uh, people on the commission. He's an ex-DVC of UCT, and he's now the Vice Chancellor of Salford. And he suggests that this idea of the article of record is very important. If you have that open under your name as a researcher, that is what's powerful. That's what gets cited, and that's what has authority. And in areas like computational mathematics and high energy physics, because they have a predominantly repository approach to producing their research, they regard a journal article simply as something they publish at the end of their research in order to provide validation for it. It's not actually read that much. So think about whether the article of record is important to you. I think the article of record also means that the <coughs> Commercial subscription journals have not been that worried about articles being put into repositories. Because you put them into the repository, it doesn't affect the value of their article of record, which is what they sell. You've got to cite that journal article. You can't cite the article that's in the repository. And that is quite powerful. Next slide. But the cost of article processing fees, as you've heard from the questions in this room already, is an important issue and has to be addressed. And there is a very real danger that an article processing fee driven system could favor the Ivy League universities with a lot of money and put them in a position where they can publish a lot if they're getting a lot of research funding. The only ways it could be resolved is through government funding and through research funding um, which incorporates the publishing fees in the research funding, which is what people like the Wellcome Trust um, always do. But we have to talk about it and we have to look at where research funding comes from in the developing world and if it is sufficient to maintain the system. Next slide. And again, as I said, government has to accept that research communication matters and has to be funded rather than saying it's got to be locked down and put into patents. One of my questions, and it's a very open question, is when it comes to the open access journals, can we be less twitchy than we are about the subscription journals? At the moment, there's a lot of um, criticism of subscription journals for being enormously expensive. As you've heard already, journals like Biomed Central have invested a lot in making African research accessible through their journals. The journals that chase impact factors relentlessly in subscription journals don't. So we have infectious diseases journals, we have tropical medicine journals, we have um, malaria journals. So with this attention paid and the attempt to reverse the marginalization of the, golden, of the global south, is this a better bet for us? Can we create partnerships north-south? Can we envisage in the end a space in which southern publishers, can, uh, southern authors can feel happy in an international journal system? It's a very open question. Next slide. Can we move beyond the impact factor with these journals and leverage alt metrics, alternative metrics, to measure more effectively the kind of research we do in areas like public, public health? so that we can get a development impact in it. Um, PLOS journals have gone a long way in this, and this is the PLOS blogs and art metrics. Next slide, next two slides, sorry, next one. So, for me, one of the big questions that came up just now, if you're publishing a local journal, PLOS one, which you've just seen, is a huge mega journal, and also, there is, next slide, the existence of collaborative journal publishing projects in the Global South, in Brazil. Brazil is now the third, the third largest producer of open access journal, journals in the world and has been incorporated into the ISI Web of Science. South Africa is part of that. Is this the answer for us? Do we look at PLOS One, do we look at CLO, and do we say we need collaborative regional publishing rather than national and localized publishing? 
Next slide. Funding mandates, as I said, will change your publishing behavior because you're going to be required very quickly, next slide, by your funders and Wellcome Trust is threatening to penalize you financially if you don't listen to them and make your publications free online. Next slide. Um, Research, Research Councils UK likewise. Diffid is going that route, all of them requiring publishing to be open. But what we need to ask is whether we're going to make Global South participation higher. And Leslie Chan is arguing that funders need to require publication of all the publishing outputs that are important, like data and, and um, research articles. Next slide. So new policies exist beyond the journal article. And the Finch report says that repositories need to be not only for journal articles, but for, develop, for research data and gray literature. In other words, all the research outputs you produce. And that, we found, is something that's happening a lot in the Global South. Next slide. Um, and that the World Bank is picking up on. The World Bank's open, open access policy says that research, their stuff must be published on a CC BY license. It must be available for translation, adaptation, reversioning for development research. The same with the Food and Agriculture Organization. Next two slides. And in our world, we produce a lot of that, art, that, that output. Go two slides further. Next one. And next one. And next one. At a huge Carnegie Poverty Conference with 174 um, organizations participating, this was argued. Our research goes to waste. We produce it and we throw it away. And we do need to stop doing that. That is happening a lot in Africa. Next slide. A lot of organizations put their research online, but don't market and promote it effectively. Next one. So if we want to compete in the global world, next one, and contribute to development as we wish to in Africa, then we have to, next slide, look at this World Bank FAO approach of making research translatable and accept uh, and usable in the context in which we want to reach out. For example, in medicine where you want to reach out to your patients. Next one, which means dealing with the impact factor. Next one. So in the developing world, as Blair and Zimande says, we need to get away from the impact factor measures to measuring impact in the people we want to reach. And Leslie Chan says finally, do we want to replicate a journal system or do we want to move beyond that and do something more complex? Maybe the kind of hub journal article you're seeing in Biomed and PLOS is the beginning point of a new conception of what makes a research publication. Okay. And that is the $64,000 question, isn't it? Which we will be talking about. Thank you. Sorry for the gallop at the end, but a lot to say. Two observations to make and possibly a question. The first one, in your opening speech, you made mention of uh, universities should emphasize on research. Uh, this is an observation I did when I read the South African Higher Council, Higher Education Council, in terms of research, no university. And there was a uh, that's the unfortunate uh, discovery was that uh, research among universities is about 0 0.03, which means that university uh, lecturers, academics do very little research. Actually, and uh, the problem is that like I have observed is that uh, most universities in South Africa do not lay a research foundation among undergraduate students. Students finish and the whole of their undergraduate courses with no specific special attention to research, except when they come back to do people's very studies that they do. So, so if it is not a full research, partial fulfillment or something, an indication that they don't get a good grounding on research. 
And in terms of policy, what do you think should be done? Well, I am putting this question to Mao Dre, because he's in the university. He's doing something like that to make sure that it's addition. Every postgraduate, sorry, undergraduate course in any university should have a research company so that after the students have gone through their studies for three or five years and further study, they have got a good foundation in research. So what do you have for graduate studies? It do not be difficult. That is the one that will take a comment or suggestion. My next point of interest is about you are mentioning of impact factor issue in terms of publications. And you may mention that this impact factor is normally a work of United Kingdom or Europe, where they uh, consider very little a work done in Africa, which makes it impossible for general that publish uh, information that is not relevant to them. What do we do about it? Okay, um, the first answer is you said that African universities contribute 0.03%, they do 0.03% of the research in the world. That's not true. They produce 0.3% of the articles in the ISI index. And there was a wonderful research article, a, a research project that the ISI did, Thomson Reuters. They surveyed African research contribution and African research systems. And they came to the startling conclusion that five or six West African countries did no research whatever. Well, just so happens those countries are French. And they don't publish in English journals. So those are very, very skewed figures. And in our project, we found what you have to do is to look at what the universities are really doing. Because we tend to ignore three quarters of the research we do. When you do an ethnographic study of what's going on in the African universities, you find numerous research organizations that are doing research. And they're putting out policy papers. And they're, they're interacting with traditional <coughs> agriculture. And they're writing <coughs> popular manuals for the agricultural workers they're working with. And they're producing health research. So we need to be very careful about what we define as research and how we measure it. But I agree we need to place the emphasis in, on research, as well as teaching and learning. I think they're all linked, in fact. And one way to do that is to be able to show our governments what they're asking. How is the research we're doing actually impacting on people's lives? And that's where art metrics become very useful. You can actually say to them, look at all these organizations that read my research in the agricultural sector, the medical sector, um, you know, in, in urban planning. So I think that's what, what we have to do. And art metrics helps us also with our journals and the ISI impact factor. But it's something perhaps we can talk about more in the next few days. You spoke about UNESCO driving open access. And my question is, what else can it do, especially to us in the development countries, in order to improve access to our scientific uh, literature? Um, UNESCO has a three-pronged plan. One is for open source, one is for open education resources, the other is for open access. Open access is only just beginning. But I think when they get going, and I don't know if Irina agrees with me, she was at the meeting in um, Paris in, December, in November as well. When they get going, and it will take them a little while to get going, I think you will find the impetus to more and more openness um, and to government policy for openness, which will help us. So if they drive in Africa greater exposure of open Afri access resources, and if they get governments more aware of open access, I think it will be very valuable. They're a very powerful organization. And if in their research reports they stop judging African countries by the number of ISI journal articles they produce and start looking instead at the real impact of African research, that will also help because then we'll be in a more sharing and open environment. But we also have to pressurize our higher education organizations and institutions um, to get into the open access agenda. <laughs>